tonight as we look at another very important subject. I sure hope you are doing well. Let me tell you how exciting this is. This coming Saturday night, Hope Awakens begins in Spanish. Hope Awakens is also going to be translated into Icelandic and French and Italian. It's going to be aired in the South Pacific in Australia and New Zealand and starting soon in India in seven different languages right there on the subcontinent. So you're part of something global and exciting. I want to say hi to Mayaka joining us from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, home of the University of Alabama. Sharon is in Avon Park, Florida. Adelpha is in Samar Island, third largest island in the Philippines. We're welcoming friends from Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, Liberia in West Africa, closer to home, Dayton, Ohio, Morgantown, Indiana, and Baraboo, Wisconsin, the home of the Circus World Museum, former home of the Ringling Brothers. Tonight, our subject is experiencing renewal. Tomorrow, survival keys for challenging times. Thank you for being part of Hope Awakens. I'm John Bradshaw. This is Hope Awakens, brought to you by It Is Written. We are located in Collegedale, Tennessee, just outside of Chattanooga in beautiful eastern Tennessee. For almost 65 years, we've been opening the Bible and offering hope to people all around the world. Watch us anytime on It Is Written TV. Just go to itiswritten.tv. Now, remember, at hopeawakens.org, you will find resources, access to previous presentations, and it's there that you can submit your questions. To ask your questions, as always, here is Pastor Doug Naar. Thanks for joining me, Doug. Hey, John, it's good to be here. Hope Awakens and also our viewers. Again, like every night, we've got some wonderful questions. Here's the first one. Now, when Jesus was resurrected, the Bible says that some people were resurrected with him. Now, where are they now? Ah, that's a good question. It would seem that they were raised and taken to heaven when Jesus went. And the reason I say this is because there's no mention of them ever dying. They don't ever show up later on in the Bible. And it says in Ephesians chapter 4 that when Jesus ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, or he led a multitude of captives captive. And this would correspond with the first fruits offering if indeed Jesus took them with him to heaven. That's what seems most likely to me. Now, you talked about death as being asleep, but doesn't the Bible say that to be out of the body is to be present with the Lord? Can it's, you explain? I, I can. It's really interesting that you would ask that question because the Bible doesn't say that. That's a misquotation of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. Many people simply say, all the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, except, you know, it doesn't say that. So let me turn in my Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I will read the verse in question. Listen to Paul. He says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. He doesn't talk about sleep. He doesn't talk about death. And in the context, he's talking about receiving a new body from God. Paul is simply saying what you or I might say. Won't it be great one day to get out of this body and to get a new body and to be present with the Lord? It simply doesn't say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We believe it, those who believe it, because you've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it, you've never read it. You've never read it because the Bible doesn't say it. So you look at that passage, read it in its context, you understand clearly what the Bible is saying and not saying. Why does God raise the wicked only to kill them again in hellfire. Now that seems so unloving. I'm really glad we got that question. You know, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's when it happens, at the end of the millennium. The saved are saved. They're with Christ, with God. The lost are about to be destroyed. And here's why they confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They recognize they are wrong and God is right. Now, Death penalty, it's a sensitive subject. No matter how you feel about the death penalty, it's always awful to have someone be executed maintaining their innocence. 
at the end of time, well, at the end of the millennium, a lot of people will cease to exist. No one will be maintaining their innocence. They will all have said, we were wrong, I was wrong, God was right. So they're blotted out of existence, but first they have the opportunity to confess, God was right all along, I'm lost and rightly so. Now, John, we have a live viewer, Carla, uh, who's tuning in, and she has a question she'd like to ask you. Fantastic. Hi, Carla. What's your question? Please go right ahead. Um, hi, Pastor John. Hey. I know that you said times when God winks at our ignorance, but God also says my people will be destroyed for lack of knowledge. In these times when the Bible is available to most of the world, don't we have a responsibility to study his word? And doesn't that mean that we are without excuse? I think for the most part, that's 100% right. Now, I recall the other night someone asked about their grandmother or great-grandmother who didn't have access to whatever it was once upon a time. Light advances. Today, I could not claim, oh, Lord, I was in ignorance. Perhaps some can. I wouldn't want to be the one who can divide the line between knows and does not know. But I think you raise a very good point, Carla, and I'm glad you did so. Those of us who have light and have access to the Bible, really we have a responsibility to find out to the best of our ability what the Bible says. Good question. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Carla. God bless you. That's a good question. So uh, the next question asks, when Satan is bound for a thousand years, Will he be alone or will he be with his angels? Oh, it would seem to me that he'll have his angels with him. Misery loves company. There'll be plenty of misery and enough company. That's what it seems. Now, you said that when the saints die, they sleep in the grave. So where does their soul go? Ah, thank you. Genesis 2 verse 7 says that human beings are made up of the dust of the ground and the breath of life. There isn't a soul. A soul is what you are, not what you have. It becomes confusing because we've heard it said again and again and again. And the Bible references the soul. I pray, God, your whole body and soul and spirit will be sanctified. But that's talking about that spiritual part of you, that spiritual part of you that resonates with God. There's nothing anywhere that demonstrates that we have a soul. A soul isn't what you have. A soul is what you are. Now, on our calendar... What do you do if Monday is the first day of the week and then Sunday is the seventh day of the week? Shouldn't that reason mean that we should keep Sunday as being the seventh day? Well, no, irrespective of what the calendar says, we know that the first day of the week is Sunday. The seventh day of the week is Saturday, the Sabbath. And so we follow what's factual, what the dictionary says, what, what the facts are. You can do whatever you want to the calendar, but you cannot change the weekly cycle. Some calendars have been scrambled just a little bit. That's true. Bring them in line with modern practices. But irrespective of what the calendar says, uh, concern yourself with what God says. And God's really very clear about this. Now, this question says, my 17-year-old daughter loves the Lord and wants to be in heaven, but the concept of eternity has always scared her to the point of not being able to speak about it. She says, I know heaven will be great and I want to be there, but what will I do for <laughs> all of eternity? Well, you'll find out soon enough. I used to think the same thing. Who want to live forever? Now I'm wondering if heaven, if, if, if forever will be long enough. There's going to be plenty to do. Why don't you just say, look, I'll trust God on this one. The Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It hasn't entered into the hearts of us the things that God prepares, has prepared for those who love Him. Just trust God. Say eternity is a long time, but God is a big God. He'll make sure it's good. Now, Sabbath is a wonderful day. How can I make it enjoyable for my kids? Oh, just do. Make sure it's fun. Get out in nature. The best thing, get involved in ministry. Serve in your community. Take your kids to visit the uh, old folks who can't get out or take them to a, a nursing home where people would love a visit or, or, or take them to feed folks who need to be fed. Do good stuff for other people. There's lots of If you ask God to guide your imagination, you can make it a great day. The best thing, try to make it a great day. Portray it as a positive day. Your kids will grow up loving it. It'll be their favorite day. Now, John, we have another live question coming in from Brian. Okay, Brian, thanks for joining us on Hope Awakens. What's your question? All right, well, I completely agree that the Bible indicates that fire consumes, and so sin is destroyed forever. 
But there's the verse in Revelation 20, verse 10, that states, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, my question is, how do I respond if someone asks me about what this means? I mean, tormented sounds ongoing and agonizing. Do I just say, well, the Bible doesn't really mean what it says there? Yeah, that's a great question. You don't want to say that too many times, do you? Uh, it just doesn't mean that. Here's what you do. You look at this in, in light of the, the, the preponderance of evidence. We know that the Bible makes clear that the wicked are destroyed. They're turned into ashes. So whatever it says there in Revelation chapter 20, it cannot contradict that. It says the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. Well, this is indicating that the effects of this torment go on forever. The effects of this punishment are eternal. The punishment itself doesn't last forever. The effects of the punishment, that's what lasts forever. Again, if your friend says, well, I don't know about that. This is where you say, look at the rest of what the Bible says, compare Scripture with Scripture, look at the overwhelming weight of evidence, and it becomes very clear. Brian, thanks for your question. I really appreciate you joining me. And please tell Raylene hi from me. God bless you. Doug. Here's our last question for tonight, John. Now, my job requires me to work every other Sabbath, and I'm struggling with this because I'm afraid I might lose my job. What should I do? What you should do is trust God and don't fear. The Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath, in it thou shalt not do any work. And so for the vast majority of us, that means that we need to be taking that day off. It's not a day to work. Ah, but I need to work. I need the job. I need the income. You know, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God will provide for you. Philippians 4 and verse 19 my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Sometimes we need to and want to take a step of faith, and it can be a real step, maybe a big step. But it's when you take those steps of faith that you see God do great things. If you've never stretched your faith, you've missed out. If Peter said, I don't think that water can hold me up, he'd never have got out of the boat and he'd never have walked on water. You trust God, give God an opportunity to act and do something great, and He will. Put God first, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And I don't say this blithely or flippantly, I've done it myself, and I can tell you that God is faithful. Fantastic questions, I thank you very much. Hopeawakens.org, you go there and you can submit your questions. Tonight's special guest is Dr. David DeRose. He represents Compass Health Consulting, is a board certified specialist in both internal medicine and preventive medicine, and he also pastors in the wonderful state of Indiana. Dr. DeRose, thanks for joining me. Great to be with you, John. Okay, we're going to talk about something really important, something that hasn't been spoken of enough. COVID-19, people are getting sick and dying. Some people are getting sick and getting sick, and others are getting sick and or catching the virus and just going right on. What they tell us is there are some people who are very vulnerable. And, and, and it appears that those who have a compromised immune system struggle more, I'm speaking generally, but I think we all understand this, struggle more than those with a stronger immune system. And so the question is, again, caution please, don't think I'm prescribing the magic bullet or this is all you need to do or anything else. I'm not saying that. But Dr. DeRose, uh, this is a good principle anyway. How can a person strengthen the immune system? Well, I mean, first of all, you're, you're exactly right, John. I mean, we want to have as, uh, as, as optimal a functioning immune system as possible. And what the challenge is, is there's a lot of things that put a toll on not just our immune functioning, but our circulatory health. And this seems to interface with this whole dialogue that we're having about COVID-19 because uh, people that have higher amounts of circulatory risk factors like diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, these things also put us at a disadvantage. So we really need to look at a comprehensive lifestyle that helps our heart, our blood vessels, and our immune systems, and you're right on point. But best thing possible, if you could guarantee you'd never be exposed to COVID-19, uh, the virus that causes it, SARS-CoV-2, then uh, you could never get sick with it. But unfortunately, 
We're in a world where this virus is circulating, and in spite of all we do with hygiene and social distancing, some of us are still going to be exposed. Okay, so if I want to get the, the, that, that strong immune system, where would you say I ought to begin? Is it what I eat? Is it, is, it, is it getting rest? Is it what I drink? Where should I begin? You know, John, both of us would be remiss if we didn't talk about some of our friends there at that wonderful health center in Northern California, in Weimar Institute. Because for years, they've been talking about new start. And uh, you're talking about a new start tonight, I know, from the Bible. But uh, new start is, a, is an acronym. It's a mnemonic that Weimar has used to look at eight elements in the Bible that help our immune systems, help our metabolism, things like nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in divine power. This is really a great framework. And you know, I have to tip my hats to, to those folks because they're still preaching that message. And it's right based on the Bible, beginning in Genesis and in Revelation. It incorporates those new start elements. Are there two or three or four things that we should, should eat or not eat if we're really serious about strengthening in our immune system? Well, let's talk about that, John. I mean, one of the things that really unbalances the immune system is uncontrolled ramping up of stress hormones. And a lot of people say, well, diet, what does that have to do with it? But uh, some years ago, a Dr. Provancha actually looked at this. Steve Provancha published in one of the medical journals over 20 years ago, looking at how when we eat more animal products, this ramps up the stress hormones in our body. And that state of ramped up stress hormones actually worsens blood pressure, it worsens diabetes, and in this context, it actually worsens our immune system. So trying to eat what we say lower on the food chain, more of those plant foods, more of those things God gave in the beginning, the fruits, the whole grains, the vegetables. And if you talk about three things, those are three great categories, fruits, whole grains, vegetables, great, because not only do they avoid those things that ramp up the immune system, I mean, ramp up the stress system that undermines immunity, but also they're filled with, filled with health enhancing phytochemicals. Now, if you want to strengthen your immune system, I'm suggesting you probably don't want to push your shopping cart out of the supermarket loaded down with gallons and gallons of soda. What do you want to be putting into your body that will give you a, a, a better chance of, of, of being well and maintaining a, a healthier immune system in terms of what you drink? No, you're on point. You're on point, John. I mean, the, the, the optimal beverage is, is water. Keeping well hydrated is optimal for our circulatory health, our cardiovascular health, and our immune health. In fact, if we stay well hydrated, uh, this helps our uh, defenses in our lungs, for example, keeping them, uh, our mucous membranes moist, keeping something called the mucociliary blanket, that uh, these little hairs and mucus uh, is in as good a position as possible to sweep away bad things that get caught in the mucus as we inhale and breathe and uh, not allowing us really to, uh, to succumb to some of those things we're exposed to. But uh, other things that are health enhancing, I mentioned the term phytochemicals. These are plant compounds that are health inducing. Some of them are, are nutrients. We don't usually use the term phytochemicals for vitamins and minerals, but uh, whether you wanna talk about something like zinc or whether you wanna talk about a phytochemical like quercetin or some of the uh, allium compounds, things in garlic and onions, a number of things have been studied in the plant kingdom that help to enhance our immune system. And some of these things even have direct antiviral effects. Do they directly uh, co you know, contrast or fight this uh, COVID-19 organism, SARS-CoV-2? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe not. We don't have all the data points, but we do know these things are health enhancing. Stock up on the uh, health enhancing whole foods. When it comes to beverages, you're right. Keep away from the soda pop, the caffeinated beverages, the alcohol. Uh, drink the water, and eat the whole plant foods. One thing I noticed is that you didn't say, here's the magic bullet. You're really talking about a, 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 a broad approach that uh, is really sort of lifestyle-based. Uh, that, that's true, right? Oh, it really is. And there's a whole discipline of lifestyle medicine. It's getting a lot of traction today, John, because really from a biblical standpoint, God in the beginning, he designed us to live forever and there in the Garden of Eden, study it out, study it out in the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22. What is there going to be in that new earth? It's going to be those same new start principles, and it's going to be founded on an abiding, trusting relationship with God that helps suppress stress, lowering those stress hormones, and dare I say it, optimizing our immune functioning.
Dr. David DeRose, I really appreciate it. It's always a blessing to speak with you. And I know that uh, you would want me to let people know they can visit you anytime. CompassHealth.net, CompassHealth.net. That's where you'll find Dr. DeRose online. David DeRose, thank you. Let's pray before we open up the Word of God. Can we do that? Let's do that right now. Our Father in heaven, tonight we are asking you to strengthen our spiritual immune system. Guide us in your Word. Lead us by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, please guide us through these challenging days. And then one day, out of this world and into the world to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Indian Pacific Wheel Race. What a bike race that is. Bicycle riders ride from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. They start in Perth and Western Australia and ride all the way across the continent of Australia to Sydney. Five and a half thousand kilometers, almost three and a half thousand miles. That's 20 miles longer than if you were to ride from Los Angeles, California to Anchorage, Alaska. It's a pretty good ride. In 2017, Juliana Buring, a European cyclist, lined up in a field of 70 riders, which included eight women, and set out from Perth. This was no stranger to endurance riding. She was the first woman to set the record or a record for circumnavigating the globe by bike, 144 days of riding. And so she set off from Perth with the others. She made it 20% of the way through the ride, one fifth of the race, where she developed a severe allergic reaction to a medication she was taking. Her hands and her feet and her head all swelled up. She had a fever. She was having difficulty breathing. She had no option but to pull out of the race. She got a ride back to Perth and then recovered so quickly that she started the race again. She re-rode those first 715 miles, which included Australia's longest stretch of straight road, 90 miles without a single bend. After pulling out of the race, Ms. Buring started over again. She started again, and quite amazingly, when she arrived on the steps of the Sydney Opera House, she had passed many of the other riders along the way, riders to whom she had given a 715-mile-plus head start. It's good to be able to start again. The history of the United States, as we know it, owes a lot to starting over. The Mayflower, that ship that famously brought this nation's original immigrants to what's now Massachusetts back in the year 1620, left England on August the 5th, accompanied by another ship, the Speedwell. But not long into the voyage, the Speedwell began to leak and take on water. Not good, so both ships turned back. After a restart, the two vessels made it more than 200 miles beyond Land's End at the southwestern tip of Britain. When the Speedwell began leaking again, both ships went back again. This time, some of the Speedwell's passengers returned to Holland while others got on the Mayflower. Then they headed back out into the Atlantic, a month or more behind schedule with depleted supplies. But we know how it turned out. The Mayflower made it to Plymouth Rock or somewhere near there, and the birth of the United States as we know it today had taken place. How many times have you been grateful for a new start or, or wanted one? I wonder if you remember when Amazon started out. It was a bookstore. It kind of stumbled along, but then redirected its energies, reloaded, and became not only the world's biggest bookstore, but the planet's biggest retailer. One New York Times best-selling author described how she recently wrote an entire book, hundreds of pages, and then she felt as though it didn't hit the mark. She said, the book just didn't seem to work. I didn't like it. So she started all over again and wrote an entirely new book, which found its way on the way up the bestseller lists. Sometimes you don't get to start over. You finish your English exam, you hand it in, and that's that. There's no going back. The cake comes out of the oven and you cannot rebake it. The kicker missed the goal, but can't ask for another try. The sculptor who chips away a piece of granite and doesn't like what he or she sees can't glue the granite chips back on and try again. There are times that a new start is good. Sometimes it's not possible, like when the surgeon in Tampa, Florida, amputated a man's leg and unfortunately got the wrong leg. Not much you can do about that. Once it's done, it's done. Right now, a lot of people are trying to figure out how they are going to start over. 
Many have lost jobs. Many who haven't lost jobs have lost significant amount of income. The rebuilding process isn't going to be easy. Some lost jobs will take a while to come back. Some industries will take a while to recover. There's certainly going to be some people for whom it'll take a good long while before they're able to feel safe getting back to life as it was before. If it was possible to press the reset button, there's no shortage of people who'd like to turn the clock back and start again from two or three months ago. But alas, we cannot. Here we are. Psychologists will tell you it's important to press the reset button from time to time so that you can reset your brain and change the way you react or act in certain situations. They'll suggest things like walking away from a situation, that you sleep on an issue before you react to it, that you write down your thoughts so you can see more clearly what's really going on in your mind. But I want to go a step further here because a lot of people have upset others hurt themselves, embarrassed themselves, caused real problems, messed up their lives, or they've done something that harms their relationship with God and they, oh, they wonder how they can go forward. I've had people tell me, John, I've gone too far or, or God could never forgive me for what I've done. Well, I want to tell you, you you're probably right. You may have gone too far, but even if you have, you can start again in your spiritual life. It's never too late to turn things around if you want to turn things around. Here's what we know. We know that the Bible says that God is love. So that's settled. The Bible says that God is willing to give people a new start. Failure is brutal. No one likes to fail. And when you failed spiritually, you wonder what God would do with a spiritual failure. Well, I'll tell you. Don't wonder. I'll tell you. James and John were known in the Bible as the sons of thunder, not because of their placid demeanor. There was a time they got offended and asked Jesus if they should call fire down from heaven and burn up the people that got their nose out of joint. I wonder if Jesus sometimes wasn't a little concerned about leaving the future of the church in the hands of people like that. A man who wrote 14 books of the New Testament was essentially a murderer complicit in the death of many Christians. He was a bad enough person that when he became a believer in Jesus, the apostles didn't believe it possible. Acts 9.26 says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. From there to writing more than a dozen books of the Bible. Remarkable. You see, that's what God does with spiritual failures. King Manasseh, a beast of a human being, sacrificed his own children to the devil. But late in his life, he had a turnaround and God made him a new man. King David, called by God, a man after God's own heart, killed a giant with a sling and a stone while still a boy. But then deception and lust and adultery and murder and more. And yet we know from our reading of the Bible, we'll see David in heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, thoroughly heathen, and yet God reached his heart in the days of Daniel. And that's another man we'll see in heaven, perhaps one of the unlikeliest people that you will meet there. The truth of the matter is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet Revelation speaks of those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's a most amazing thing. God refers to these sinners as saints. Revelation 15, 2, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, his image, his mark, and the number of his name. Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It wasn't long, Adam and Eve had eaten the fruit that they should not have eaten. So look at God's response to what your original grandparents did back there. Genesis 3.15, God says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. He said to the devil, Devil, you'll bruise the Messiah's heel, but he will bruise your head. You may win a battle, but you won't win the, win the war. That was God's promise to a rebel race that salvation was possible. Even after the disastrous fall into sin, keep in mind, 
human beings would have access to everlasting life because Jesus would come and die for them. So, and I really want you to see this, Adam and Eve sinned, guaranteeing that Jesus, the Son of God, would die on a cross. And God responds by saying, I'm giving people the gift of repentance and I'm guaranteeing Satan won't win and that people who want to be will be saved forever. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Ultimately, God's people will say, oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is your victory? The message of the Bible is a message of redemption. It's a message of a new start. Where do you find a new start? When you want to start all over again, what do you do? When your credit's been messed up, that follows you around for years to come. You break the law, you do time in prison. Society may tell you you've done your time, but that sentence follows you around. It's hard to get that monkey off your back. Lose a job. People will wonder what you did wrong. Get a divorce. And there are people who will look at you sideways no matter what the circumstances truly were. But there is a God in heaven who's the God of a new start. The God of a second chance or a third chance or a a 1,000th chance. However many chances you need. Romans 5.20 says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You know, one challenge we have as human beings, we're conditioned to believe that nothing's really free. Well, salvation is. Now that is, it's free to you and me. It costs God plenty, more than we can adequately say. But God bore the burden and offers us the blessing of it all. You get to the last book of the Bible, it begins by saying, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And a few verses later it says, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. God loved us, God washed us, it says. God will elevate us higher than we could ever have dreamed. In the final chapter of the Bible, we see this. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into that city. I wonder, can you imagine that in your life, in your experience? This is what God does in the lives of people needing to experience renewal. God would change a heart and change a life. This is the thread that runs all the way through the Bible. Look in the New Testament. A woman caught in sin is forgiven by Jesus and told that he doesn't condemn her. All around her were were people ready to see her suffer under the full weight of the law of the time. But Jesus doesn't condemn her. Another woman is getting water in the heat of the day. Now, typically, people would get water morning or evening when it's cooler. It's evident that she's wanting to avoid people, to avoid their whispering and their condemning gaze. She's an outcast. But when Jesus reveals to her that he knows all about her colorful past, he offers her everlasting life. The famous story of the prodigal son sees a young man, sees a young man leave the family farm and wander off into a wasteful existence where he brings real shame on the family. But the Spirit of God draws him back calls him back and he responds by making the long journey home. No longer the cocky, brash young man, but now a a broken man, beaten down by loss and failure and rejection. I imagine he rehearsed his speech all the way home. And when he arrived, he told his father he is no longer worthy of being called his son, but instead should be treated as a servant. His father, keep in mind, The father has been deeply embarrassed, deeply insulted by this boy. His father doesn't even address the boy's mea culpa. The father instead addressed the servants, telling him quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf here, kill it, let us eat and be merry. You find that in Luke 15. Why was the dad so deliriously happy? Because as he said, For this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. They began to celebrate. The father was overjoyed because his wandering child returned home. Shame? 
What was that in the light of the return of a child as though he were back from the dead? Wasted money? No, wait, don't talk to me about that. No time for worrying about that. A child has come home. The family's reputation. Oh, no, listen, ladies and gentlemen, my son is back. That's what we're talking about here. And that's how heaven feels when one of God's children responds to God's drawing and comes home. If you're a parent, you'd know how you would feel if your wandering child came home. That's how God feels. But even more so, even when things have gone bad, God welcomes us home. I'll show you what God did in the experience of one such individual. I mentioned him earlier. Saul wasn't a bad man as far as bad men went. He described himself as being very law-abiding, very strict, very dedicated to his religion. But he was off track, a persecutor of God's people. Aren't you glad God doesn't cut off people who don't have their act together? Instead of rejecting Saul, God appealed to Saul. And when Saul yielded to God's invitation, a man named Ananias spoke to Saul, who later became Paul and said to him, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. Next verse. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. He then said, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord, a new start. And that's not the first time something like that had been said. Jesus spoke directly to this in Matthew 28. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Why would God tell Saul to be baptized? Why would Jesus tell the disciples to make disciples of others and then baptize them? Well, let's go back to a discussion Jesus had one night with an important man, a man who came to Jesus by night so no one would see that it was this homeschooled rabbi he was talking to. Nicodemus had his reputation to think of, evidently. He came to Jesus and tried something that you might call righteousness by flattery. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him, which seemed like a nice thing to say, except Jesus could see the state of the man's heart. And so he said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, the man was flummoxed. What could this carpenter's son be talking about? And so Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Of course, that was an absurd question. But Jesus answered it with a straight answer. He got to the point. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Born of the Spirit is conversion. That's the change that the Holy Spirit brings into a person's life when they come to faith. That's the radical remaking God does in someone's experience. God's Word says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Do you see how God describes this? When you come to Jesus, God remakes you. You might have been a failure before, but now you're remade. You might have got things terribly wrong before, but now you're remade. This is what God does. Now, let me say this to you. Part of the problem we face is that we equate performance with acceptance with God. And I could see how we would do that. You come to Jesus, you ask him to take your heart and you go right out and yell at your neighbor. And so you come to the conclusion that something went terribly wrong. You might also come to the mistaken conclusion that this proves you're not a real Christian and that Jesus didn't take your heart and that it was all a lie. And why should you waste all your time anyway, as all you are is a big hypocrite? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that maybe your failure might have nothing to do with you being a hypocrite and everything to do with something else. 
you remember that little Bible story where Jesus talks about the work of God in a person's life? He says it's like seed growing. He says it grows first the blade and then the ear and then the full corn in the ear, and he meant wheat, and then the harvest. Your life as a believer in Jesus is a life of growth. I'm not making excuses for failure. I'm not saying it's okay to yell at your neighbor or your spouse or your kids or even your dog. What I am saying is that everything else in the world, whether it is a cat or an oak tree or a whale or a salamander, everything in the world grows. No child was born ice skating, born throwing free throws successfully. Growth takes time. If you put a seed in good soil and then give it water and sunlight, it's going to grow. It won't grow all at once. Corn is going to take 60, 70, maybe 90 days to grow. A couple of months for tomatoes, longer for tomatoes. Pine trees are going to take 25 to 30 years. That's just how it is. You can't microwave them to grow quickly. So come to Jesus in faith and grow. Keep your feet planted in the soil of the Bible. Water your soul with prayer. Turn towards God like a flower turns to face the sun. Keep looking to God and you'll grow. Again, don't be yelling at your neighbor. But if you falter, if you slip, if you fail, don't throw in the towel because God isn't done with you just because you made a mistake. God makes you new. This is what it is to be born of the Holy Spirit. It's conversion. It's being born again. That's born of the Spirit. Born of water, that's baptism, water baptism, a sign of having your sins washed away. In fact, it's like an enactment of the experience of salvation. In Romans 6, it says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Let's jump to verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Before you come to Jesus, you are the old you. This is something a lot of people just don't understand. When you come to faith in God, the old you dies. God creates a new you. Too many people don't have that experience. They come to Jesus as they are, and they stay as they are, and they think that's okay. But the old you dies. So what do you do with the dead you? The old you is buried in the water of baptism, and a new you comes out of that water to walk in newness of life, as Paul wrote. Baptism is a symbol of that old you dying, being buried, and the new you being raised up from the dead to live a new life. It's hard to know why the subject of baptism gets confused. The Bible says clearly, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4 and verse 5. Jesus' example couldn't have been more clear. Read it in Matthew 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan, sorry, to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he'd been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus came up out of the water because he'd been in the water to be baptized by immersion. Maybe what's most important is that God was well pleased. In fact, John wrote that John the Baptist baptized at the River Jordan for the simple reason that there was much water there. Philip met a man from Ethiopia riding in a chariot. The story says in Acts chapter 8, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ 
is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him in a river because there needed to be enough water to baptize the man by immersion. And you need to see verse 39. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Ah, that's important. There was rejoicing that took place. New life had been born through baptism. There was rejoicing that took place. The word baptize simply means to immerse. That's what the word means. So if it isn't immersion, it isn't baptism. And Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. What baptism does is it brings together two important things. There's the belief, which you do inwardly, and then the demonstration of that belief, the outward sign, baptism. I mean, you can say you love someone all you want, but the wedding ceremony is what makes that love official. It's your witness to the love that you are experiencing. Baptism essentially functions like a grave, a grave between the old life of sin and the new life of faith in Jesus. It's there that you experience renewal. You've experienced that by faith, but now your sins are washed away. You've been made new and clean. You're able to say what Paul said when he wrote to the Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you've wondered how it came to be that there are so many different kinds of baptisms around today, you're not alone. But it went like this, basically. You know, until about the 13th century, baptism was almost entirely by immersion. You can visit old cathedrals and see that they have baptistries where they used to baptize people by immersion. In churches where they gave up on Bible baptism years ago, they once baptized by immersion. If you visit the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you'll see that at the cathedral complex is a baptistry. People were baptized there by immersion at one stage. In the 14th century, sprinkling was accepted by the church as being just as valid as immersion. It took a long time. For several centuries after the establishment of Christianity, baptism was usually conferred by immersion. But since the 12th century, the practice of baptizing by infusion has prevailed in the Catholic Church as this manner is attended with less inconvenience than baptism by immersion from a book called Faith of Our Fathers. So they changed because of inconvenience and due to the false teaching that a person is born with something called original sin, which Augustine said, would lead to an unbaptized baby going to hell if he or she died without that original sin having been remitted by baptism. Rather than immerse a baby, it was thought to be just as valid to sprinkle a little water on the infant's head. Of course, that's not the least bit biblical. So what should a person do now? Considering baptism, what do you do if you want to be biblical about this? I can suggest three things. Number one, repent. That means to be sorry for and to turn away from your sins. Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Now, believe. As Paul told the jail keeper in Philippi, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And then follow. Remember Matthew 28? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, Jesus said. Baptize people after they become disciples. A disciple is a follower. You choose to follow Jesus and you signify that in baptism. Now, this isn't something babies would participate in. Baptism follows a personal decision made by someone who could repent and believe and follow. As a baby, Jesus was dedicated. That's what's appropriate for babies. When a person is baptized, listen, this is God saying, I've given you a new start. 
you messed things up, you've embarrassed yourself, you've, you've hurt heaven, ah, but we can start again. I'll give you a new start. When a person is baptized, that person has the assurance that his or her sins are forgiven. You receive the Holy Spirit into your life. You become part of the family of God by adoption. This is a new beginning with God, like a marriage ceremony unites two people in baptism. Baptism unites a person with Jesus at his church. You come to Jesus. He takes your heart. Then the old you is buried and a new you is raised up to live a completely new life. There's a great story in the Old Testament about a man named Naaman. Naaman had leprosy. It was a terminal illness. He learned about the prophet in Israel. Someone said, that prophet could heal you. So he traveled to see the prophet. Oh, Naaman was angry though. He was angry that the prophet didn't even come out to see him. But instead, Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. This important man, a captain in the Syrian army, didn't much like the idea of washing in a muddy river. And the Jordan River isn't the Amazon by any means. Naaman figured, we got better rivers back home in Syria. But it seems that he was chagrined by the idea of doing something so simple. Naaman's servants said to him, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? You know, people still have that same challenge today. God says, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and you can be saved. But that's not enough for some people. You are saved by grace through faith. That's not enough for some people. It's too easy. You can have eternal life simply by accepting what I've done for you. No pilgrimages, no penance, no price to pay. Just believe and you can know I've given you a new heart and a new life. Too simple for some people. They want to make it harder. They want to work. They want to make it difficult instead of accepting the gift. Jesus has done the heavy lifting for you. He died on a cross. Naaman agreed he'd go down to the river. You know that leprosy is a symbol of sin. And just as Naaman's leprosy was washed away, you can have your sins washed away. Jesus asks you to enter the waters of baptism, to become a new believer, to receive forgiveness and cleansing, a simple thing. Naaman wanted to create a scene about it all. God just wanted to save him. Naaman might have gone home to Syria believing there was a better way, but Naaman wouldn't have been cleansed from his leprosy. God says, I will cleanse you easy. Just go into the water. Of course, there was nothing in a river that would heal a terminal illness. But that act of faith and following God's leading and doing what God asked, that was an act of saving faith. Can you exercise saving faith in Jesus now? He invites you to be baptized. The easiest thing ever. If you've not been baptized or if you've been baptized, but you feel like you should be baptized again, I want to give you the opportunity to follow Jesus by faith right now. I'd like you to make a decision. You know how we're going to do that? I want you to send me a text message. When you text me, text me the word NEW. My number is 423-264-2575. I'll say it again in case you want to write it down. 423-264-2575. That's the number you're going to text. The message you're going to text is one word, NEW. And when you text the word new to me at that number, I will text you back. Okay, what's the number? 423-264-2575. Send me a text message. New. I'll text you back. And the message you get from me will say, I choose to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. When you text me back, text me the word yes, would you? I'll text you again. And the second text will say, I would like to be baptized. If that's your desire. You text me the word yes, and I'll text you a third message, the one that says, I have questions I would like to discuss. Let me know if you do. And then you'll get a fourth message saying, how may we pray for you? 
and our team is going to pray for you. So walk through this with me while I get my little cards here, my Hope Awakens cards. The number you're going to text is 423-264-2575. 423-264-2575. Now, you text me. It may take a while for the text message to get you, seconds or a minute or two, depending on how many people are texting at once. That's okay. You text the word NEW to me, and I'll send you a question, send you a text. I choose to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Respond with yes. Go ahead. When you text an answer to that first statement, I'll send you a second one. I would like to be baptized. I would like to be baptized. And when you text that to me, uh, it takes an answer to me. Let that be yes, if that's your desire. And then there'll be a third one. I have questions I would like to discuss. And then there'll be a fourth question. How may I pray for you? Tonight is an opportunity for you to make a decision for Jesus. The number 423-264-2575. Text me the word new. It's not too late to do that. I want to pray for you now and pray for your decision. Can I pray for you? Come on, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, tonight we've learned that we can experience renewal, that you'll give anybody the opportunity for a new start. Tonight, you've spoken to us from your word about the renewing of baptism. We're making decisions right now, Lord. Don't let anybody say no who should say yes. Give us grace to commit to you now and ever as we accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Here's something else I'd like you to do. Go to hopeawakens.org. There you can submit questions. There, you can watch previous presentations, and it's there you're going to get the Bible study that goes along with tonight's presentation. Thanks, Jose, for the reminder. Hopeawakens.org. Be sure you get tonight's study material. It will bless you. And I'll see you tomorrow for more on Hope Awakens.